Good evening. It's been a long time since the beat of my heart was a friend. That's the line of that song that really stuck out for me. It reminds me of a Gerard Manley Hopkins poem that begins, My own heart, let me more have pity on. Let me live to my sad self hereafter kind. That's a familiar sentiment and predicament to me and probably to a lot of you as well. The focus of this conference is how to have hope in the face of despair, specifically how to wake up in such a way that we can remember what hope is and what we are. No small part of the reason why consciousness turns inward and becomes corrosive is because we lose the sense of consciousness. There's a cumulative feeling right now of being overwhelmed by what, actually? Is it all the political noise, the environmental and economic problems that have come to seem both intractable and crushing, the despair attendant and where we seem to be heading as a country, even as a species? Is it all of this put together? Blaise Pascal famously said that all the problems of the world could be traced back to our inability just to sit quietly with our own thoughts in a room for an hour. It's been a long time since the beat of my heart was a friend. How do we befriend the beating of our hearts if we can't even hear it? Waking up, that's the first step. I'm struck by and completely agree with Father Giussani's notion that Christianity inheres in an event. Precepts, doctrines, every last scrap of theology, this is all secondary. Why would anyone pursue God if they'd never felt God? But we do lose faith with that feeling. It gets drowned out by cultural noise and simply the daily necessities of survival. The good news, though, is that the event is not singular. It ramifies through every area of our lives if we can just learn to listen. Here's that first slide. This poem ends with a, if you've ever lived in England, you know that on the radio they have the shipping forecast. And it's a bit mysterious if you haven't ever experienced that. But that's how the poem ends. It's called Prayer. Some days, although we cannot pray, a prayer utters itself. So a woman will lift her head from the sieve of her hands and stare at the minims sung by a tree, a sudden gift. Some nights, although we are faithless, the truth enters our hearts, that small, familiar pain. Then a man will stand stock still, hearing his youth in the distant Latin chanting of a train. Pray for us now. Grade one piano scales console the lodger looking out across a Midlands town. Then dusk, and someone calls a child's name as though they named their loss. Darkness outside. Inside, the radio's prayer. Rockall, Malin, Dogger, Finisterre. Faith comes through hearing. I always think of that line from the Apostle Paul when I read this prayer. Paul's talking about spreading the gospel, but as is often the case with Scripture, some charged and less teachable truth has infiltrated the lesson. Faith comes in this deeper sense, not through taking in and assimilating the meaning of words, not really through content at all, at least not primarily. It comes literally from the air, from sound. I would say it's pre-Christian if Christianity didn't itself contain its own cosmic origin and extinction. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God origin because that verse puts Christ not simply at the beginning of creation but as its source 
and means of sustenance. Extinction, because every human utterance exists in the shadow of and is annihilated in the full light of that divine one. You can't hear the word, the lowercase word of God, until you've heard the uppercase word of God. The first is imparted, the second intuited. The lowercase word comes from a minister of whatever sort, a poet speaking to you at a conference, for instance. The word, uppercase, might come from the leaves of a tree, or a rudimentary piano lesson, or radio's shipping forecast. Sound, then, that's the first thing to attend to in poems, and what a sound that solemn sonnet makes. It's so beautiful, in fact, so consolingly clear and assured that you might not notice the enormous gulfs of despair and unbelief that it's carried you over. There's a sense of volatile melancholy in the poem. Is that woman with her head in her hands, is she praying or is she grieving? It's a sorrow just on the verge of revelation. The theologian Alexander Shmemon says, the knowledge of the fallen world does not kill joy, which emanates in this world always constantly as a bright sorrow. And then that sorrow becomes more explicit. In the poem, someone calls a child's name as though they named their loss. The pain of childhood, even if it's just the sense of its end, gets healed over by time until one day you find yourself with your own child whose presence gives you so much joy that it jolts loose a sadness, a wound you'd forgotten. And you call your child's name as though you named your loss. The truth that enters our heart is restorative and necessary, but it's also a small, familiar pain. W.H. Auden once defined poetry as the clear expression of mixed feelings. The truth of this poem is small and familiar and deeply consoling, but it's also pain. Prayer ends with those place names from the shipping forecast as if the very earth cried out to God, as indeed it does sometimes in Scripture, which is precisely the point. Some days, although we cannot pray because we're too busy or because we're in too much pain or simply because the whole culture seems calcified around us, a prayer seems to utter itself. There's a wrenching moment near the end of Marilyn Robinson's novel, Lila, when the title character and her husband, John Ames, are discussing, even sort of arguing, issues of faith and prayer. And Ames finally throws up his arms and he says, family is a prayer, wife is a prayer, marriage is a prayer. By which he means to say something similar to what Carol Ann Duffy is saying in that poem I just read, that the world and our soul, our existence and God's are far more permeable and much more possible than words like faith, truth, or even prayer can suggest. A poem can be one of those minor events that recalls the major one. It can shock consciousness awake to reality, and a consciousness that's truly awake to reality is awake to God. That can be a hard thing to realize and hold on to, though. We seem to never stop hungering after something that we can never quite name. Some years ago, I wrote a whole book trying to answer the question, what is it that we want when we can't stop wanting? In that Carol Ann Duffy poem, the answer seems to be God. Freud thought the answer was death, an urge in organic life to restore an earlier state of things. The common answer of our own time is that there is no answer. It's all just nature. Genes rotely ramming home their mechanical codes one by one. We want because dissatisfaction equals survival. We are designed to improve and impart our hunger, breeding descendants with ever keener teeth. If we are conscious and honest, each of these answers will likely seem right at various times in our lives. If we are conscious and honest, each of them at another time will seem wrong. As I was working on that book, I came across this quote by the theoretical physicist John Polkinghorne. 
the first quote there. What gives continuity are not the atoms themselves, but the almost infinitely complex information-bearing pattern in which they are organized. The essence of this pattern is the soul. It will dissolve at death with the decay of the body, but it is per a perfectly coherent belief that the faithful God will not allow it to be lost, but will preserve it in the divine memory. What is that? That we might be remembered. What an almost impossible thought that is. That there's a consciousness capacious enough, merciful enough, to recall each of us in our entireties, just as we recall our own fragile but all meaningful moments, that our lives might be the Lord's insight. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just before his execution by the Nazis in 1945, wrote a surprising little poem that he put in the margin of something he was reading. I demand my own life back, my past, you. That's not what you expect from someone who's confronting his own death. It's not the future that Bonhoeffer feels slipping from him, but the past. Not some totality of existence he fears losing, he still believes in salvation, but it's molecular singularity. All the minute perceptions and sensations retained by the body, if not the mind, that comprise one particular human consciousness. What is it we want when we can't stop wanting? Lord, praise a character in Ilya Kaminsky's Dancing in Odessa, give us what you have already given. Twenty years ago, I became editor of, of Poetry Magazine in Chicago, and the first official event over which I presided was a long-standing Chicago tradition called Poetry Day. That year, it culminated with a large public reading by Mary Oliver, the poet Mary Oliver at the time, she was easily the most famous poet in the country, though famous poet is maybe a hard phrase to utter without irony. <laughs> Mark Strand once said, it's like being famous in your family. <laughs> Still, poets do tend to acquire outsized egos, and I was prepared to meet someone with a kind of impenetrable nimbus around her. Not so. I first saw her in the lobby of her downtown hotel, dressed for this upscale occasion in hiking boots, wrinkled chinos, and what appeared to be a hunting jacket a size too large. It looked like she might have cut her own hair. Her head was bent over a thick book that I saw as she rose was the Fairy Queen. My face must have registered some surprise. I'm not young, she shrugged as she opened her knapsack and exchanged Spencer for a pack of cigarettes. I want to spend what time I have left with masterpieces. And she meant it too. I saw her on a couple of other occasions that night, including right when we were sitting next to each other and she was about to go on stage with that huge poem open reading it. Mary was traveling alone because Molly, her partner for over 40 years, was already sick with the illness that would kill her. Not that Mary mentioned any of this to me. We talked of one thing and another, and we were walking down Michigan Avenue, and, and Mary suddenly stopped and picked up a piece of meat. At least that's what I thought it was. When she spread that gray-red mess out on her hands, you could see that it was, or at least it had been, a bird, a pigeon, in fact which she proceeded to describe with avid eyes and intelligent touch and showing me exactly where the hawk had struck, where the talons had clutched and torn. And she said that probably the hawk had dropped this half-eaten carcass into the crowd and it wasn't able to recover it. We stood there for a minute. It's a huge reading we've got to get to. I'm getting nervous. I say, Mary, we got to go. And she takes that bird and she sticks it in her pocket. She kept that with her all night. She kept it while she was giving the reading, and she kept it in the party afterwards. And I know this because at one point we had both retreated to the kitchen, and she took out that bird to show me something else that she had noticed. <laughs> the sense of mortality, our own, of course, but also those that we most love, it doesn't cast us backward only, like Bonhoeffer. It also 
propels the imagination forward. It makes us imagine heavens in which wounds are healed and losses restored, or to ameliorate oblivions by imagining our atoms alive in other forms, like Polkinghorne said. But heaven too often turns out to be little more than projections of the precious self ad infinitum. And it's a cold comfort to think of one's dear smithereens blasted through some new forms of matter from which we, whatever it is that makes us, us, have vanished. Here's Polkinghorn again. I'll just read it to you. No, it's not that one. It's, uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Death is present in this world because of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in the end, disorder always wins over order. However, it seems perfectly coherent to believe that God could bring into being a new kind of matter with such strong self-organizing principles that the drift to disorder would no longer happen or perhaps that the notion of disorder would be naive. That we might be a form or part of a form whose fruition, for now, we can intuit but not inhabit. That heaven and oblivion might have one name, which every poet, in one way or another, is trying to speak. Now we'll read that poem, that White Owl poem. This is the Mary Oliver poem. Coming down out of the freezing sky with its depths of light, like an angel or a Buddha with wings, it was beautiful and accurate, striking the snow and whatever was there with a force that left the imprint of the tips of its wings five feet apart, and the grabbing thrust of its feet and the indentation of what had been running through the white valleys of the snow. And then it rose gracefully, and flew back to the frozen marshes to lurk there like a little lighthouse in the blue shadows. So I thought maybe death isn't darkness after all, but so much light wrapping itself around us, as soft as feathers, that we are instantly weary of looking and looking and shut our eyes, not without amazement, and let ourselves be carried as through the translucence of mica to the river that is without the least dapple or shadow that is nothing but light, scalding aortal light in which we are washed and washed out of our bones. Why a poem about death when we're talking about trying to wake up to life? Because unconsciousness of death or wrong consciousness of death is often the very thing that keeps us from apprehending life. To be conscious is to be conscious of death, and you must figure out what right consciousness is in that regard. Father Giussani also once said that the proper spiritual life inheres in the development of a gaze, a right way of seeing. Let me end with a poem that seems to me the best example of this I know of, both right consciousness and this gaze. Osip Mandelstam was one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. He died in 1938 when he was 47. He was last seen at a transit camp for political prisoners in Siberia picking through a garbage heap for food. It was a situation that he had long foreseen and actually sort of precipitated. In 1934, with incredible bravery and suicidal foolishness, Mandelstam recited at a literary gathering a poem that he'd just written, a very famous poem. Now it's known as the Stalin Epigram, and it, it turned all the great leader's pomp into a kind of puppet show. He called his must, compared his mustache to a cockroach. He said that he was a pig farmer, and of course, Stalin was very sensitive of that, thought of himself as an intellectual. Maybe Mandelstam believed he was among friends, though even friends had begun to watch their words by then. Maybe he believed in his own gift so utterly that he mistook imaginative freedom for actual freedom. Maybe he had the saintly sense not to credit safe distinctions between kinds of freedom. 
Men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, before he left New York to return to his beloved and benighted Germany, did only what his own soul bid him to do. In any event, someone at that literary gathering in Moscow, someone whose memory was trained in just the way that Mandelstam's was and could recite a poem after hearing it only once, whispered it in the ear of one of Stalin's goons, and that was it. From Moscow to Leningrad to outer exile in Voronezh, Mandelstam and his wife Nadezhda lived on the move, subsisting on scraps and hope, on love and poetry, on fear. There's a little poem about the tiny little poem. Come, love, let us sit together in the cramped kitchen, breathing kerosene. There's fuel enough to forget the weather. The knife is ours and the bread is clean. Come, love, let us play the game of what to take and when to run, of come with me and come what may and holding hands to hold off the sun. Probably, though, the epigram only accelerated events that were inevitable. Stalin was absolutely obsessed with Mandelstam. It was the pure lyric spirit of him that Stalin couldn't abide, the existential liberty and largesse. It was like a free-singing soul that Stalin felt was the one thing that slipped through his nets. People who think poetry has no power have a very limited conception of what power means. Even now, in this corporate country where presidents don't call up poets on the phone, some little lyric is eating into the fat heart of money. But it's more than that. Poetry, all art, protects and sustains the consciousness that the blob seeks to erase, needs to erase, if it's going to maintain power. One life, one mind, one instant responding to the minims sung by a tree or the poem that lets you hear it, these things matter immensely, both in terms of preserving a spirit that's worth fighting for and for fully sounding all the notes God means to sing. For I am convinced that every single one of us is part of some ultimate unity an existential symphony of sorts. But we have to allow ourselves to be sounded, as it were, have to discern what our particular note is. I will leave you with this one utterly true note, which is the last poem that Osip Mandelstam wrote. He was completely aware of the fate that bore down upon him, but he was still astonished at consciousness, both its gift and its cost. And I was alive in the blizzard of the blossoming pear. Myself I stood in the storm of the bird cherry tree. It was all leaf life and star shower, unerring, self-shattering power, and it was all aimed at me. What is this dire delight, flowering, fleeing, always earth? What is being? What is truth? Blossoms rupture and rapture the air, all hover and hammer, time intensified and time intolerable sweetness, raveling rot. It is now. It is not. Thank you. The Beethoven Fifth Piano Sonata in C minor is a melancholic piece. Melancholy, sadness are a clear and moving signal that being born for happiness is not a phenomenon that concerns just an individual person. It involves everyone and everyone's destiny. In the embrace 
of one's own heaviness, of one's own fatigue. At a certain point, the horizon opens up and everything takes on a lightness. Toil, pain, physical suffering are not taken away, but one feels happy because he is supported, sustained, helped, loved. The itinerary traced out by the three movements of the sonata is the same. In the end, the limitation of things is transfigured. And in the limitation itself, we have already an anticipation and a foretaste of the unlimited. Almost a twilight, almost a dawn that is not yet here, but is already present. Within the ultimately still blind horizon of our experience as men, there is already this vanishing point. And what reality is a sign of enters into the sign and touches us, urges us, and says to us, let's go together.